Hello and welcome to Good Art, the podcast, episode five, part one of my interview with Rose McDowell. We go over her life growing up in Scotland, touch on her music a little bit, religion, philosophy, kind of all over the place, but it's really fun, really honest and uh, raw, and it's lovely for those reasons. I hope you enjoy. Um, okay, ish. Yeah. Well, okay, that's a standard answer, right? Right. That's a, so it, I'm standard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's great to talk to you. Um, thanks for doing this interview. I'm glad we're finally doing it. Yeah. Um, it's, I'm like, no, it's, it's always better for, to, for me to do interviews if I, I tend to do them. If I'm forced if I'm into a position at a time, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But and to do it on the phone, then I'm kind of cornered to do it. It's not leaving it up to me. I need to kick up the ass sometimes to do stuff. Sure, like sure. But because my friend last week, so I couldn't really do anything. Right. Who was that, by the way? I was trying to find that out. He was in a band called... It was in my first band, Poems, the Poems, and he played violin for us. But then he was a journalist. He did reviews, and I was a journalist for New Musical Express. I wanted to start by saying happy birthday. I know it's your birthday coming up. Yes. Well, actually, funnily enough, 18th is my magical birthday. So you're on time for that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my tw- 21st is my like birth birthday. Yeah. So you mean magical birthday? Do you mean um was there some sort of ritual where you were like reborn or yeah. something like that? Yeah. Yeah. And when was that was th- in the late eighties. Probably about eighty six. All right. Well happy magical birthday. And uh Thank you. Yeah. So I know you started your first band was the poems, right? Is that that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and I was a drummer. I was predominantly the drummer in the poems, but I did do some vocals as well. Yeah. And, uh, but my ex-husband, Drew, was the front man. And then there was Tommy Udo, which is a pseudonym. <laughs> he was on viol- violin and... Our guitarist Ian Hillcourt, who is an old friend of Drew's, was sorry, Tommy was on the violin, um, and um, Ian was a guitarist. We also worked with um, a guy called Malcolm on the clarinet occasionally, but it wasn't a predominant instrument in the band, so we didn't tour with that or anything. And you guys were you guys were a band for how long? Like four years or so. Or you were in the band for the, the poems. Yeah, um, from about, um, I guess I guess it was about that. Honestly, to be honest, I can't remember. I have a very bad relationship with time, um, because it's man-made, basically. Sure. <laughs> and it yeah. doesn't, you know, it doesn't work for me. It's like, you know, I have my own time cycle, which is really weird. It's it's really difficult. In fact, when you're trying to do things with other people, <laughs> yeah, I can. you have meetings and stuff like that. It's like, oh my god, how am I going to be awake at that time? Because that's when I do this, and how am I going to be there? You know. But I've always had the bad sort of I'm trying not to be a late late all the time person. Yeah, that can be difficult, though. Yeah, I, I sort of, I can relate to with living on your own time schedule. I, I kind of, I, yeah, I kind it's of, like things like school and all that. When you're young, it, it's a bit harder to do that, to be free to do that because you got even even then, though, I used to jump out of bed straight to the bathroom, forgot breakfast, and ran out the door and ran to school. But I had to usually take my siblings to the bus stop first, and then 
when the bus came, uh, if I got my bus, I'd have been late, so I would just run to school. So, but I was a fast runner. <laughs> <laughs> so you sent the, the poems. Did you guys break up, or you just sort of left the band when Strawberry Switchblade started? We kind of broke up, I suppose. It was like, because me and Drew were the main body of the poems, really. So when I left, it was it just kind of just started working with Strawberry Switchblade then on, you know, like doing like his we t- we um, toured with um backing with a real T V basically. And Drew was in charge of that. And Jill's boyfriend, he did quite a lot of Strawberry Switchblade photos and he um did like projections and things like that. So we kind of worked it so that the strawberry switch played with the two of us, like after we split up from being four, and Drew and he, um, Peter came on tour with us. So Chill couldn't have done it on her own anyway. So it was a good way to get her to do things, was to make sure that her boyfriend was there. Right, right. She couldn't really do, do things on her own because of her agoraphobia. Because before that, it was like, she had to get her dad to take her everywhere or someone to take her everywhere. But when she met Michael, not Michael, I'm getting mixed up with everybody. It was like her um, boyfriend, Peter. I used to, I, I think I, I met Jill through Peter or he, she met me through him because I used to hang, I was like seeing Peter before, before I met Drew and me and Peter were always hanging out together so when I met Drew, right after that, Jill started going out with Peter. So we were all mates anyway, you know, so it was, it was all really good fun. Yeah, it's sort of I mean, the early days of Strawberry Switch would be just so much fun. It's unbelievable. Like, that, it's quite unbelievable that it ended how it did, considering how it started. You know, it's quite tragic, really. <laughs> Because it started as basically we we just wanted to have a band, have fun, write songs. It was cathartic for me to, you know, get rid of my demons and stuff like that just by writing and and it was it was so good. And we just did it for a laugh, and the the, the idea behind it was basically we're having fun. If anyone else likes that, that's a bonus. But we didn't really pamper to any scene or to any, you know, we just did what we wanted, what came natural to us. And having been brought up in the 60s, listening to loads of music, I mean, my influence, musical influence was my dad. He wasn't a musician, but he was a connoisseur of music. He had loads of records, loads of albums from the 50s and 60s and so I was just brought up on my dad's music and and the melody that from that era, because the 60s were very melodic, so, so the, the 50s, like Buddy Holly and people like that. Um, and then the 60s, it was Giff Uncle and all the psychedelic stuff. And I had three babysitters who were sisters, and so about a year between them, and they were all like different genres of the 60s. So I got to, when they babysat, got to listen to their records all the time. And I think that's where my my passion for harmony comes from. Really just listening to all that amazing stuff that was coming out of the, that came out of the 50s and was coming out of the 60s. So my musical influence was not a specific band although everyone says they were underground and obviously they were an influence, but because they just didn't influence most people on you just by being who they were, being so out there. And But my dad, if I was to say anybody, would have been, he taught me to drive when I was 18 months old. So <laughs> that explains a lot, really. Yeah. 
so many of us have to thank our dads and our babysitters for uh, exposing us to good music. I know, it's, it's incredible. Uh, and it was so good that I had like three sisters that liked different genres, so I wasn't stuck with the, the same thing. And uh, one of them had said, t- like, I didn't like the stuff, like, hers was stuff like, um, I don't know, really middle of the road, kind of bone and sexy stuff that I've never been into the middle of the road, anything, you know? Right. I've always, and then one was anti psychedelic stuff. And, you know, Tommy James and Sean Dells, so like that kind of stuff. And the other one would be in these things like the Mamas and Papas, Simon Gifunko, which is kind of very melodic in her and um, full of harmony, harmonies, and was more of more of what you would hear on the radio, more, uh, sort of genre of music, but not quite. Middle of the road, you know, it's like more, much more exciting, amazing songs like the Capitals and things like that. She would be in there. Yeah, it's a little more expressive. Little, there's, there's more, more to the music, more behind the music than your middle of the road radio yeah, stuff. But, yeah. Yeah, and, and and lyrically, I think, I think like the sixties, especially some of it was like really dark stuff. You know, but it was like behind, behind all the sort of like floral stuff that was going on behind it, and some of the psychedelic, like the sounds, were quite often a distraction from the vocals, because sometimes the vocals were people didn't really people kind of half made it up, up the vocals of a song because they couldn't understand if they couldn't understand it, they just filled the gaps. But a lot of those songs are, I, I think, probably everybody's guilty of that a wee bit. But, and then when you find, when you find, like, the, the real lyrics, what it's really saying, it's like, it's, it's just really quite eye-opening and cool and sort of, like, obviously, they had a lot to say in the 60s. But even the 50s, like, musicians were up against that because they were all... Rock and roll was satanic, wasn't that? Right, Supposedly. Right. <laughs> yeah, the devil's music. Exactly. It, it wasn't thought of like that over here, but it was thought of that in America, wasn't it? Yeah, very much so. Like, yeah. like people like Elvis, mm-hmm. Spawn of Satan, like guys that were like, was a nice guy. <laughs> yeah. He loved his mom, he sort of. Not, not that Satanists can't. No, certainly love. not. No. That's nonsense. You know, it's like, but I mean, pe- people like to pigeonhole. They like to put you in little categories. And some people, it's very hard to do that with. Like, I've been told many times we don't know, we don't know how to sell you. You know, we don't have a pigeonhole. Like, well, the whole point is. I don't belong in one. You know, there isn't a pigeonhole for me. I think that's, I th- I think that's one thing that really separates you from a lot of, you know, a lot of the, uh, well, like certainly like strawberry switchblade, like, like you guys, you guys were just doing pop music, but it had, it had so much more to it. It had so much more emotion and um, sort of these things lurking in the background that that sort of just set well, it I've, apart, you know? Yeah, well, I've always been like, people used to say to my mum when I was a toddler, like, and and I was a really cute little thing with ribbons, like red ribbons in my hair and pigtails, and they would look and they'd say to my mum, She's an awful morbid little child, isn't she? But it was only because I liked ghosts and I was interested in all the stuff that little kids were probably scared of. But they totally, all that stuff intrigued me. And, like, I know that I was born with... I think everyone is, everyone is born with instinctual... People might call it magic, but it's just instinctual properties that we have like intuition and like like a lot of senses that we 
would have had naturally have been dulled. People work on things like that now to try and get them back or to try and get them. But I don't think everybody believes that how I believe we were born with them and we had them kind of, you know, twisted out of us by society. By the time you're six, you've, you've kind of been told you can't, that's silly, this, the, you know, whatever. By the time you're in school, you're, you're already on the road to being totally brainwashed. Right. But, I mean, the minute you're born, people... People start. I was I was born and christened Catholic. Now from that point on, basically, there was no reason why I should think there was no God because all my life, that's all my family and all my extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins. I've, it was there was no question about it. When you're really young, and because it's all you know, it's like the sky is blue. Okay, God is everywhere. Okay. You know, you believe your mum and dad tell you, don't you? And you're just like, or what everybody else is telling you. But I soon realised that, no, it's not for me. I need answers. I, I, don't, I don't believe in blind faith at all. I want, and I think, that, like, I was naturally born with, with those instincts. I was born a witch and a fairy witch. And I will always be that. And I always was aware I knew I was different even as a child. Everybody treated me different, but, you know, it never bothered me. I just, cause my dad used to say, sticks and stones will break your bones, but names will never hurt you. So I just really didn't really care about being called names or anything because I knew I'd rather be me than one of them. That's a, that's a tough thing to do as a little kid too, you know. That, that's... Uh... That's a strong, well, I did strong go to Glasgow, aspect. which is quite a tough place. You know, it's like do or die up there. When I was well, in the seventies, and and the like, I lived in I guess you would call it a ghetto in America, but over here it was just where you know poor people lived. And I grew up in a very poor area that was pretty violent. There was a lot of gang wars going on. And to be perfectly honest, they, there was not a lot of discretion that went with it. You know what I mean? It was like there were people who... It's like if it, I always felt sorry for boys because if you're not in a gang, you're a target. And also the targets were territorial. This is our area. You know, like animals, it was sort of like... Basically, they didn't come piss on you. They came and chopped your head off with a machete. You know, yeah, that's geez. how they map the territory. You just knew not to go there. I mean, even going home from school when I was a little kid, I had to cut through people's gardens and climb over fences and stuff just so that I didn't pass the Protestant school, which I would have got beaten up if I'd get caught by any of them. You know, so people, it, we, we learned very young how to survive basically. And when I was a teenager, as soon as I, I mean, basically God left my, like the whole thing about God being a real thing. I was a teacher's nightmare when I was at school because I was in large education. Always had my hand up. Always was, I was not satisfied with contradiction and religion is full of it. And I know that as an individual, one can be contradictory because you can sometimes see both sides of the fence, do you know what I mean? And that yeah. somebody might say, well, no, you have to choose, you have to choose. Well, no, actually, you don't have to choose. You can see that point of view and you can see that point of view. Both of them can be valid. Nobody has to choose one thing or another. You can be part of, or even not, but you might not believe in it yourself, but you can justify someone else's beliefs, do you know what I mean? Because otherwise, you'd, you're dictating to everyone. In religion, especially when it's like there, there is this belief, and that's what you're told. That's what you expect to believe. Well, my wee brother was murdered when he was ten years old, and I was eleven at the time. And I heard my mum say, "If there's a God, he's a cruel God, and I don't want anything to do with him." 
And I'd never heard any of my family say anything against God, ever. And then it, it, that just put a seed of doubt. And although I questioned all the time, it was like, I didn't need any proof that there wasn't one, just as much as, like, I wasn't given any proof that there was one. It was just, I just followed my own instincts. And my, I heard my mum say that. Oh, earlier on, obviously, I had the choice. You're always taught in Catholicism especially, do you have a choice? And I would just say, well, what is that choice? You do as you're told, or you burn in hell for eternity. That is not a choice. <laughs> like, nobody's going to choose to burn in hell at and that's a threat, not a choice. And the teachers didn't like me for saying things like that. But then I just totally... thing is with Catholicism is it's, it's based on fear and guilt. I mean... Yeah, and gore and blood. Yeah, it's outrageous. It's how I grew up, grew up such a guilty, and I was a very innocent little child, but I was guilty of everything. I mean, my, when I had to go to confessional, my worst confession, like, I, my confession was the same every Thursday. You know, it was like, I was cheeky to my mum and dad. Um, I might have swore, you know. I, you know, I was not a bad child, Um but my worst thing was I took a donut out of my granny's fridge without asking, which is essentially stealing. So I had to confess that. But that's the worst thing I ever confessed. And he had me out there praying like a whole rosary and our father, which I like, was like speed wrapping. So nobody else in the chapel who was praying um, to have their sins washed away. So they wouldn't know how naughty I was because he gave given me so many prayers and I would just say them as fast as I could. And, you know, but I wasn't naughty. And it, but that's what Catholicism does to you. It makes you think you've always been watched, you've always been judged. If you see a priest in the street, I thought he could read my mind. So I would go bright red before he even got to me and I hadn't even done anything. You know, that's kind of sick, twisted thing the church does to people. It makes them ashamed to be human. Ashamed to breathe, ashamed to do anything that comes natural. You know, it, it's like the biggest, the biggest like religion causes more wars than anything else on the planet. That and capitalism, greed. Um, but it, you know, it's like it, that is the biggest contradiction. Love thy neighbour, but let's kill them while we lo- love them. You know, what I mean, and I just thought. Oh, this is insane. I mean, there were murderers in my street. There were murderers in the in the building I I, I lived in, and some of them were Catholics. Now, what is that all about? So I just like abolished Catholicism. But I did actually. My cat was we moved house. My cat ran away, and I was sent to chapel. We just moved house. It was a new chapel. And I had my wee white dress, shoes, bag, hat, gloves, everything all in white. Um, off to chapel on a Sunday morning because I was the eldest. I was the only one going. Um, my siblings were young, all younger than me. And I was, they thought I was old enough to go on my own. I was only about seven. And I was too scared. I was, I was excruciatingly shy when I was a child. Um, although I did join the choir. But I was so shy, so I thought, I can't go, I can't go, I can't go, I'm too scared. So I didn't go, and I thought, I'll set up a course and wait until it's time to be home. And I had my tuppence for the plate, you know. They're always taking in money, and it's always the poor that give the most, you know. And so, like, I took my tuppence, and I went and spent it on sweets. And when we moved, my cat ran away. We moved into 10 James Earl Street, that was, which is on the Strawberry Switchblade album. We just moved in there, and my cat had run away because cats don't like moving for the start. She was freaked out. And on Sunday, she came past me while I was sitting up this course in my little white outfit, avoiding chapel because I was too scared, waiting until it was time to go home. 
which would have been a bigger confession than next week again. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about that. But my cat went past me and she was foaming at the mouth and I sort of ran after her, called Tri- Trixie, Trixie, try to catch and get her. And I had her in my arms and she was, I think she'd got into a fight and there were quite a few feral cats around there and I think she's got into a fight with cats and there was this boy who was in his teens he seemed like kind of a man to me but I was only seven he was in his teens he took my cat off me and he said she's dead she's dead or it's dead and he I I was screaming no she's not no she's not and imagine doing this to a tiny little girl I probably looked about five when I was seven or even four I was so Young for my age, and I so he took the cat off me, dropped the cat in the dustbin, and set it on fire in front of a seven year old child. And that was probably one of the worst, it was the worst death things that I'd seen that ended in death, you know. So, yeah, that's horrific. And I believe I thought that's God punishing me for not going to chapel. That's what Catholicism does to you. So although this brute of a bully took the cat, put it in a dustbin, set it on fire, I could see my cat screaming, I could see his hair sizzling, I could smell it. It was it was horrific. And but I thought it was my fault because I didn't go to chapel and I spent the money with on sweets. And stuff like that made me think, you know, I'm I'm not guilty of any malicious things to anybody. You know, I, I complete empath. I was the only person in 10 James Hill Street that would do, that I used to go shopping for all the old people. Because in the 60s, there was still a lot of poverty in Glasgow, an awful lot of poverty. I mean, there was still dysentery and TB and oh, diseases like that that, that we don't have to worry about anymore. But, and I would always go shopping for all the old people because I always think, well, people dismiss old people like you've had your life or if you go to your home and we'll talk to you like a baby. Now, if I ever get to that position, somebody talks to me like a baby, they'll get a whack <laughs> because I think people, older people deserve respect. Right, right. And I, used, I used to go visit them. And the old ladies, I mean, it's, it's tragic. You get old, you're useless to society and people ignore you. Well, actually, you know what? Those people have a lot of stories and a, a lot of things to teach society, not just about the war, you know, but how to avoid things like that as well because they've lived that, you know. And most of the time it wasn't, they didn't want to tell little kids stories about the war anyway because it was too horrific, you know, but they had... A wealth of knowledge. I always think that people ignore old people, and that is a crime. And especially when they start talking to them like "good, good, ga, ga," like they do little babies, which I don't even do, did that to my baby. I mean, they like funny noises, yes, but I didn't treat them like they were idiots, you know. <laughs> and yeah, you got to talk to them like people. Well, exactly, exactly, because it, it, children learn through mimicking just like most all animals do that i mean little animals if they're left without their mother they won't survive because they won't know what to do even if they're able i know some animals aren't able and to do anything without their mother they just die but some animals are functional as soon as they're born but if they don't let go through the learning process of copying you know like monkeys, all animals do, human beings including, then you're not going to learn anything. And so when you're brought up in a really hostile place, it's very difficult to not not be depressed, not be sad, not, not be scared not be sometimes violent joining in. She can't beat them, join them sort of attitude, which I was like, which never entered my mind. My mind was like, bring them down. (laughs) My dad got hit in the head with an axe twice and it was a case of mistaken identity. My My dad was deaf and someone asked him if he was someone. 
my dad said yes, thinking the person said, do you know someone? He got hit twice in the head with an axe. That man came to my house to say, say my mum, it's not going to go any further, is it? Because it's mistaken identity. I was about 14, and I just flew across the room at him and thought, no, you're not getting away with it. And, like, neighbours were pulling me off. And it wasn't until afterwards that I realised that my mum said it wouldn't go any further because she was protecting her brood. She was protecting her children. Right. My mum, all in all, had seven children, and she knew that if she charged this person, who is a member of the local gang, you know that we would get a petrol bomb or something through the window. So she knew that she couldn't tell, you know, because she had us to protect. But because of all the injustices that I'd seen, I, thought, I just thought someone's got to stop it, and I'll take metaphorically speaking, I'll take the bullet for it. I don't care. I'm not going to let them bully me. So I went through my life, like, I ended up fighting the people who were bullying other people because it got to the stage where nobody would bully me anyway because although I was really quiet and really quite shy, um, if you push the red button, (laughs) I will flip, you know, like, and... And all that happened through post-traumatic stress after my wee brother being murdered and me watching him die. And I just, I can't stand injustice and I cannot stand the bully. And I won't and I never have and I never will. Do you think, um, do you think all of that, all of that stuff, did that push you towards music as a way to express those feelings and that pain and that fear? I, I I think I wasn't I wasn't aware that that's what it was doing until I done it. If you know what I mean. Yeah. When I look at my, my lyrics, my lyrics are all, I mean most most of them are biographical or touch me personally in some way. And yeah, I do. I think that's like like when I write a song, I'm, I tend to sort of like once something's recorded and it's sent out there, I don't let. Li- I'm not one of those people that listens to their own stuff all the time. You know, I tend to sort of move on. I will listen occasionally, but I don't constantly listen to my own stuff um, because I've just, that stuff has just taken some tragedy out of me. Why would I want to listen all the time and take it back in? I mean, I do listen because I think that it's good to listen occasionally. I can go for months without listening, even years sometimes without listening to some of my stuff. And I have friends who constantly listen to their own stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think that would kind of bore me, probably. Is that I, I'm at my most exciting, excited when I'm actually writing and creating yeah, the song. It's, it's and always I think a good, it's, it's always like a good child. Feeling. Once it's finished, recorded, it's set off out there into the world and it's up to others to interpret what they get from it. And in actual fact, some people will say to me, you're like Leonard Cohen, you write like Leonard Cohen, you write music to slash your wrist to. And then other people have said to me, you have helped me through so much. And so you get the two... I think some people, people. What I really believe is that people do not, they do not divulge into like sorrow and tragedy. They're always running from it. But you have to stop and you have to look it in the eye, and you have to deal with that. And a lot of my songs are are quite tragic. You know, even if the melody is pleasant and poppy, lyrically they're quite sad. And it's because I, I really think people should be celebrating sorrow as well, not because it's a great thing, because it's something that we all do. And it's like if you look up in the closet, you know, it's going to cause you more pain. It's going to it's going to cause you to be to have post traumatic stress disorder. You know, you have to not ignore these things. You have to live through them, process them, and deal with them. And when a lot of people don't write like that, you know. They tend to want hits, chat hits, and things, so they don't write about sorrow. But 
sometimes people like to know that there's other people in the world that feel like they do. Yeah, it's, and it's a good form of therapy. People have, yeah, totally. And people have said that I've like people who have come to, to see me play in Glasgow from America because they're having relationship problems and they're really sad and like something like Let There Be Thorns has really got them through this and they've come all the way to Glasgow for a gig from America and I think that's crazy. Like, But people come from Japan sometimes over here and I guess if you can afford it and, you don't, and you've got the time, it's probably not such a big a deal, but I just think it's quite incredible that people will travel so much um, and, t- and tell you that you have got them through or through the worst period of their life or you stopped them from killing themselves, not made them. And hope with your sad songs, it's just that they can relate to that, even if they're not relating to what I've written about, because I can be quite, you know, not always straightforward with my lyrics. And I can be a bit cryptic with them, you know, but because there's a wee bit of me maybe that self feels vulnerable about opening up too obviously and also it's boring <laughs> to yeah. write like that. So I like like I like to when I'm writing I actually like to try like write things that create images in people's heads. Do you know what I mean? They're not just listening to the words but they're seeing things as well. They're vis- visualizing and I think if you can manage to do that then that's really good. I was reading an interview uh, that you did. You were talking about how you and Jill were really getting tired of doing like the the teen pop magazine interviews because they were just asking you yeah. like, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite food? And then... Yeah, get, where do you buy your ribbons, you know? Yeah. F off, you wore a strangle you with one. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, you said that you guys, you guys would, uh, you guys would kind of lie and say like, well, you know, we'll get some mineral water and then we'll uh, mud wrestle and take a oh, shower that together. Was, yeah, like that, that was me. I was the one that would fed them interviews because I was so bored with being asked things like that. And we did a, we did an interview for a women's magazine and it was like really a women's magazine about shopping and food and crap, just a, a piece of domestic shit, really. Right. <laughs> But we did so many interviews for so many things, and I just thought, this is, like, I'm going to have a laugh with this, which was my way of, you know, keeping myself sane and also showing people that I'm like, we're not two silly little girls who just care about makeup and getting dressed up. There's, there's way much depth to it than that. And but I just told this, I totally made up, and then a thing about. Oh, we were supposed to do an interview about what we do if we have dinner. What's a typical dinner party at our house? And I think Jill wrote something about having baked potatoes and jacket potatoes and things like that, you know. And and I wrote about oh, we get um, go to the chip shop, get something at the chip shop, and get some. I bought a nice bottle of mineral water because we're in here. We're health conscious. After just saying being the chip shop <laughs> to eat, and I was going to because we're health conscious. We buy a bottle of mineral water, and after dinner we mud wrestle. And the women are just like you what? How can you mud wrestle at home? I mean, I know it's easy. You just get one of those big blow up, blow up rubber baths, you know. Fill it with mud, with clay, with whatever you want to fill it with. Fill it with that. And my drizzle just enters the room, put the pool in there. And and, it, and she was like, you actually, my drizzle? Like, boys and girls? And I went, yeah, it's mixed, you know. It's like, and I was I had really straight face and <laughs> not a, a, a hint of a smile on my face. And then she was saying, and then what do you do? And I went, well, we just shower and, you know, go and sit and listen to some music. You went, what, what you shower together? And I went, well, some people shower together, some people shower at whatever, you know, do what you want. And 
honest to God, I thought she would just see right through the lie because it was too outrageous for a magazine like that. And it got printed. <laughs> it, it actually got printed, and that was just, it was hilarious. I was forever having my mum call me up saying, ah, is this too much wrong? Are you right, okay? Yeah. And I went, Mum, don't believe everything you read. <laughs> But I would say that to before, like ever since my little brother died, because he reported his death. Like, you know, they just said basically what the sort of people wanted to hear. And he was murdered and there was no room. For me, I'm, I'm like somebody who's really, I mean, I'd, my idea of what's right and wrong is not the same as everybody else's idea of what's right and wrong. If there's a law that's completely ridiculous, I don't feel any guilt at all about breaking that law because it's, I mean, some some laws in, in Britain anyway, you know, are, are, are thousands of years old and they would, if they had the time, get rid of loads of them. I mean, there are so many li- live laws right now that if they would put into practice, all sorts of things would be happening to people, to, to people, you know, They'd be getting their heads chopped off left, right and centre. But these laws are they're kind of dead laws, but they haven't actually been abolished by Parliament yet. But, but, but I'm not talking about those laws. Those laws are so ancient that nobody really even knows about them, most of them. But, I mean, I, if I think something's ridiculous, it's ridiculous. I, I don't care. If somebody's starving and they steal a pasty out of a supermarket, then let them do it. What's one pasty to a supermarket? They'll probably just throw it out later at the end of the day, you know, if no one buys it. Exactly. Right. I know lots of people who who wait, like lots of homeless people or lots of poor people who wait to the end of the day and go in and buy the the, put, the stuff that's put on the cheap shelf because it's the last day of selling it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if, I mean, what's more important? And for a, for a start, I mean, it just goes down to... To insurance or loss, things get broken in supermarkets all the time where they're being delivered and whatever. So somebody's hungry, bloody feed them. You know, it's much more important than than some of the other. So rules like that, I think, are rid- like ridiculous. But so I would never say he's the law passy. I would never tell on anybody. I'm not that like kind of person. But unless it was something very very serious, but. I don't, I don't break the law. I don't go out my way to break the law. I just don't abide by the things that I think are stupid, <laughs> and they tend to be stupid anyway. You know, the, I mean, I'm not talking about anything like outrageous or anything. There might be some things in there outrageous, but not not in my mind. <laughs> yeah, I think. Um... I mean, people people had. People had to break the law to live their own lives. Yeah. If you were gay, for example, you know that was that was against the law. Now that's insane, right? Yeah, or being I mean, a I witch. Yeah, it's completely insane. How can it be against the law to love someone, no matter what sex they are? And I just think, well, you know what? If you didn't, if if everyone was like dressed the same, if you if everything was homogenous, you didn't you shouldn't tell them as a girl or a boy, but you you fall in love with that personality. You don't fall in love with somebody's genitals. Do you know what I mean? Right, right. I mean, you may be predisposed, pre to say, oh, if I can't get it out, um, to a certain to you might just be attracted to the same sex knowing full well it's the same sex well you know there's loads of reasons for that some of them are genetic some of them are some of them are just part of society quite a lot of people are attracted to the op- the opposite sex because like I know somebody personally who is who is a male and who was assaulted when they were quite young and is kind of bi but the friends keep telling them you have to choose you can't be bi but the reason this person who's a male he he's fought with this for his whole life I mean um, he's in his 40s now 
and he's fought with it in his whole life and he just had to decide to accept the gay person in him. Although he does think that's probably stems from his first sexual experience ever was when he was assaulted by a man. So the association with sex was with a man. So that he thinks that's probably what made him gay, but he's not sure. But he likes men and women, but his friends were putting him under pressure to choose because you can't be both. Now, and a lot of the time, actually, it's genetic, it's all sorts of things. It's, it could be any reason, but you just do not judge because each individual has the right to choose what they do with their life as long as they're not harming anyone else. And I'm outraged, outraged that, I mean, even when I was a little kid, I was never bigoted about anything. I mean, like the young 13, 14 year old boys would come out to me at school before they told the parents or anything because they knew that I would get it and that they could they could actually because living with that yourself must be very hard and having anybody that you can share that with is very valuable and in Glasgow in those days there was a lot of gay bashing going on and I'd be running between two friends going, he's my boyfriend, he's my boyfriend, stop hitting him. And we were only 15, I didn't even have a boyfriend. And <laughs> but they were my gay friends and people were beating them up. So I was trying to pretend that I was their girlfriend so they wouldn't beat them up. Because people use knives and all sorts. It, it, the particular incident I'm talking about was, got sort of, they did run off. Um, but stuff like that, I can't, I, I, I won't deal with that kind of bullying. I have been attacked physically myself. I've had my head split open with someone who was going to kill me because I was defending a guy that they were calling, that three other guys were calling a puss. And there was loads of people at the bus stop because it was midnight buses. Nobody interfered, nobody did. And these three guys were just poking and prodding at him and he was just standing at the bar waiting for his bus with a bag of chips and so I just thought I couldn't stand this I jumped straight in there and was like does it make you a big man three of you picking on one person That made, and I was calling them Neanderthals and all sorts and this guy started saying that he was going to kill me and his two friends said they calmed down a bit because I wouldn't and he was getting so irate and he threw a can of beer at me and it hit me in the head and then fell over the railway bridge. <laughs> and his pals were telling me, stop, because he will kill you. And I just thought, fuck off, I'm not giving in to this idiot. You know, and eventually when they saw the blood, I didn't even know my head was bleeding, but it was bleeding and he split my head open and it started running down my face. And as soon as he saw that, he ran. Now, he probably ran then because he was on probation. Right. Because he was probably one, the kind of guy that would have murdered or maybe had murdered somebody, you know, because even his friends, like, who'd come down saying, he will, don't push him. Now, that's not because of any trauma. That's because he is the fucking trauma that he, uh, that is he is p trying to possess on the rest of society. So, I mean, he was just a downright bully and he had no empathy. He was probably a total psychopath. I don't know, I never saw him again. But there are, there are people who are born or who get sucked into that world and you can't make excuses for them. Yeah. I did for so yeah. long. I used to think everyone could be everyone would be good. When I was a tiny little girl, I would say to my mum, people wouldn't do that, mum, if they only knew, would they? Like, if they only knew it was bad or it was naughty, or I was so young that I didn't, you know, I was a tiny little thing, or a toddler at the time when I would say that. And But then, even until my early 20s, I, I actually thought, do you know what? Just put them up against the wall, give me the machine gun. And I'll fucking get rid of the scar. <laughs> I got so angry and disappointed because I was, I I was championing the fact that everybody would could be nice 
a nice person. You know, not everybody wants to hurt, they're stuck in a rut, blah, 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 blah. But they didn't even fight for their own sanity. So I got really disillusioned in my early 20s and I just thought, you know what, these people are making life miserable for the whole of society and just don't even put them in prison because they just kill each other in there. And, you know, I guess it was kind of a flippant remark because I would never machine gun down a lot of people. Right, right, right. But I got to that point where, you know, you just think, for, I, I'm i not standing up for anybody doing anything bad anymore. You know, I'm not going to blame it on the background because, you know what, in a close of a tenement building with six houses in the one building, there were two families that were okay. Ours was one and the people that lived it. Underneath us, every other, the other four houses or flats were occupied by bank robbers, murderers, you know, one one who was like, that's just for me, across from my nice family, was a psychiatric nurse who beat my neighbour's head in a woman the the wife of the man that my dad got hit instead of. Um, he beat her head in with a coal hammer. And she she survived. She was in hospital for two years. And then when she came out of hospital, she had to learn to talk again and everything. And he was a psychiatric nurse. And it's like, I said, what is this world made of? I cannot relate to these people. I'm not from this planet. I can't be, you know, right. because... It just does. It makes no sense to me, and I don't know what happened to him. But it, it was violence that killed my little brother as well. You know, right. two boys held him while the other one kicked him, oh. and he died a couple of days later. A few days later. Did like, you in um... the same thing happened to my cat? They they both got attacked on the Thursday or my cat ran away on the Thursday and Michael was attacked on the Thursday and both of them died on the Sunday and both of them were murdered basically. The cat was murdered by some sadistic twit who, I don't know, had no regard for animals and who probably grew up to be a nutcase. Mm -hmm. You know, we we already was one, but you know what I mean? Violence would have turned to people except... He, he he wouldn't have been a gang person probably. He'd have probably gone down the sort of secret criminal, you know, the the rapist, the serial killer, the the, the criminals that skulk and hide behind corners because he was a coward. You don't you don't pick on little tiny kids. Do you know what I mean? You don't right, do right. stuff like that. I mean, if if he if he was a tough man, he'd be fight, He'd be in one of the gangs. You know, but no, he just he just picks on the little people. Well, sometimes the little people bite back. 